Okay, let me get us started. Good afternoon. Welcome to day two of the inaugural Cal OER conference. My name is Shelley Winance. I'm one of the California State University representatives on the Cal OER organizing committee. Before we introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to recognize and thank our sponsors. A huge thank you to our sponsors, the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges, Open Education Resources Initiative, Libra Techs, the Michelson 20 Million Minds Foundation, California State University Affordable Learning Solutions, and OER Commons. A reminder, if you use social media, please share what you're learning from the conference. We'd love to hear from you. And lastly, just a couple of quick reminder announcements. All presentations at the conference have live captioning available. Please be sure to visit the homepage on Pathable, this tab right here, homepage to read the land acknowledgement, and also take a look at the resources tab on the Pathable page. There are lots of great resources there, so please take a look. A reminder that as you go to your different sessions, the join meeting button will appear one minute before the session start time, and that the Zoom chat is disabled in all sessions, so please use the Pathable chat. You can find that, whoops, on the main page that you logged in. There's chat, polls, files, et cetera. So please make use of that. And I'm gonna turn things over to Delmar Larson, who will introduce our keynote speaker for today. Delmar, take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> the crafting and implementation of progressive policies is critical for the success of open initiatives. Today's keynote speaker will, has over two decades of policy making experience in Sacramento. She was Governor Brown's higher education advisor, is currently a UC regent. She is a strong advocate for OER, and in 2018, she launched the California Education Learning Lab to improve learning outcomes and close equity gaps across all three higher education systems. Please welcome Lark Park. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank, Delmar, thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, I'm really, uh, I'm super excited to be here today. I was uh, speaking with somebody last week uh, about this event, this inaugural event, and we were both talking about how exciting it was that this event is even happening. Um, and there was a suggestion that maybe this could be an annual event. And I know the conference organizers are probably like, no, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of work that goes into this, but that was sort of the immediate like, oh, we should do this every year. Uh, but in any case, uh, as Delmar mentioned, I'm Lark Park and I am the director of the California Education Learning Lab and a member of the University of California Board of Regents. Uh, I'd love to know who is in the room, so to speak. And I know we had a few poll questions set up in Pathable. I think you have to navigate to the poll tab to see the questions. And it's just a handful of questions about which segment you're affiliated with, uh, what's your disciplinary uh, expertise, how long have you, have you been teaching, um, and are you an experienced uh, user of OER? I'm just kind of curious to see who has signed up and, and, and who, um, who I'll be talking to and who I'll be hearing from because I'll be asking you to chat back. So, um, so anyway, if you, if you didn't see the questions before uh, and, and you can see them now, just uh, fill, fill out some of the questions and then um, I will ask Shelly. Shelly, do you see any responses? Is there kind of a, a clue as to who's in the room? Yes, I see them coming in. So in terms of higher education segment right now, ooh, it keeps changing, but right now 14% are University of California, 12% Cal State University, 71% from the California Community Colleges, and 2% other. Okay, that's great. Great showing from the community colleges, uh, as expected, probably, um, given how much uh, how much money that they're getting from the governor this year. Um, anything else in terms of the other polls, uh, disciplinary expertise or um, experience with OER? So in terms of discipline, right now, 31% have identified themselves as STEM. 41% uh, humanities, 29% social science. In terms of how long they've been teaching students, the largest number is over 10 years with 56, 57%, keeps changing. <laughs> uh, then 18%, five to 10 years. Also, oh, it changed again. 20%, I'm, an, I'm a librarian. 
uh, and 7% under five years. <laughs> great, great. And, and what about the last one? Yeah, in terms of experience right now, it's 50, per, oh, okay, wait, just changed. 49% are newer to OER, 41% are very experienced, and about nine to 10% haven't used OER, but are curious to know more. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And great to know that, that there's some people who are OER curious who have come uh, to, to this conference. Uh, so before we get to the OER portion of the talk, I did want to tell you a little bit about the California Education Learning Lab. Um, then I have some perspectives to share with you, which I'll call Notes from Sacramento, um, where I live and work and have had tw a 20 year long career in state policy making. Um, then I'll go on to talk about what I think is the new frontier for OER. And I'd love for that to be a somewhat interactive session uh, where I see your comments uh, from the chat. And then Delmar, I'll sort of turn to you to sort of uh, comment on, on what, what you're seeing there. Uh, but then can we go to the first, um, I guess the second slide, slide number two. This is the California Education Learning Lab. Um, and and uh, just let me know when you see the slides up. Okay, I, I see some. Okay, I see some slides up. Um, can we go to slide two? Yeah, sorry, just um, trying to uh, view it in the... Uh full screen mode. Okay, there we go. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, we call ourselves Learning Lab. Some folks call us CELL based on our acronym. And we were established in 2018 by statute as a state funded grant making organization. Um, and Delmar mentioned this, we're charged with improving learning outcomes and closing equity gaps across California's three uh, public higher education segments. So what does that really mean? Um, we award competitive grants to intersegmental faculty teams at California Community Colleges, the CSUs, and the UCs uh, for projects that use the science of human learning to improve teaching and learning. Um, and in addition to the grant making, we do things like host convenings, webinars, we commission and publish research briefs, uh, and we curate online resources as well. Uh, we are an initiative of the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, and we're administered in partnership with the Foundation for California Community Colleges. Uh, next slide. So I really wanted to include a slide on our values because for me, uh, this slide really captures our essence more than anything else does. Uh, we operate on the premise that all students are capable learners with potential for success, given the right conditions, supports, and motivations. And we believe that faculty are our greatest resource in helping students meet their goals, and innovation begins with the faculty. Uh, next slide, please. So a word about our theory of change. Um, it's about driving this feedback loop between research, practice, and policy. And in so doing, uh, we are hoping to turn the wheel, so to speak, of the public higher education ecosystem, which includes all of you, faculty and administrators, state policymakers, and other higher education uh, stakeholders. And in reality, you know, this slide uh, needs to show us as Learning Lab much smaller and the public higher education ecosystem is huge, uh, but you get the gist of, of how we're trying to make some change here. And if you go to the next slide, it's a close up of our wheel. You can see the different components of what we do or we're trying to do. Uh, it involves innovation, that awarding grants to faculty to test and enhance innovative approaches to teaching and learning. Um, it involves theory and research. Uh, it's about having our funded projects contribute to that field of human learning and then disseminating findings to faculty and other stakeholders. Um, it involves community, really importantly, fostering that collaboration across um, all the public higher education institutions and building communities of practice among the faculty. Uh, it's educational practice. It's, it's the collecting and promoting um, the best teaching and learning practices, such as inclusive um, pedagogy, culturally relevant pedagogy, uh, which is already, you know, uh, there are different sessions um, in this conference about that. Uh, and then finally, it's, uh, it's about educational policy. How can we leverage the findings and the evidence 
from our projects to influence the broader state policy um, and funding uh, for that matter as well. Uh, so next slide. So just distilling our contributions, um, it really is we're a testing ground for faculty innovation, we're a connector for UCCSU and community college faculty. Um, we want to disseminate free and low cost resources produced from our projects and it's actually part of our statute so it's part of our DNA. Um, and then finally, again, just bridging that theory of practice, which we think is so important, um, not just to contribute to the field of human learning, but really to improve student success. Uh, next slide. So in addition to the grant making that we do, um, functionally, uh, we're very focused on grantee success because that's where the value is. The value is what our grantees are doing. And so we're constantly thinking about how can we amplify that work? How can we scale that work? Uh, next slide. Uh, we also want to take um, what they do, right, the, their findings, their data, and then leverage those insights uh, to drive the systemic change, make it the basis of systemic change. Um, and then the next slide, we are functionally very focused on expanding our networks and our partnerships because you can't have systems change without a, a, a very robust network and very robust partnership. So that's, um, that's something, these are the things that we're functionally focused on doing in addition to the grant making work. Next slide. So just in short, uh, we have about 39 um, funded projects that involve hundreds of faculty. Um, the 225 is really who's leading the projects. And then we have many more faculty involved in each of the projects. Uh, we've committed about uh, 25 million in grants over the almost three years we've been in existence. Um, and uh, we have uh, about half of um, all of the public higher education institutions represented in our projects. We have all the undergraduate um, UCs, we have uh, uh, the vast majority of CSUs, and we're slowly and steadily making progress within the community college system, which obviously is the largest system. But I've I wanted to highlight this work because I wanted to highlight that we are a faculty focused grant making program. Um, we're actively striving and hopefully strategically striving for both systemic and culture change. And we really believe in the power of open educational resources. Um, I'll talk about some of the work that our grantees are doing and how it's relevant for advancing OER. But all of our grant funded projects have as a requirement that anything that they've developed with Learning Lab funds uh, be made available as an open educational resource. So I highlight these things because there's a lot of overlap that I see between Learning Lab as a program and the OER movement, and we know that we can really be a strong ally in the OER movement. And part of uh, the talk will explain sort of uh, the how and what I see in terms of these intersections. Um, so the next slide. Uh, so I have a few messages I wanted to convey based on my conversation with folks in Sacramento about what they think of the OER movement. Um, and then uh, let's advance one more slide. Uh, so this is called a decade of OER, right? Um, and you know, many of you know that legislators and their staff and governors and their staff have been really supportive of OER um, with both legislation and funding. Uh, in 2012, there were the Daryl Steinberg bills, uh, SB 1052 and 1053, which established the California Open Education uh, Resources Council at the three academic senates and was really the first foray into saying, hey, let's fund this development uh, uh, very intentionally of uh, open source materials for commonly taken lower division courses, right? So it basically said, we wanna invest in this. Uh, and then 1053 established the digital open source library at CSU to house open source materials. Um, and then sort of the next kind of major, um, major piece came in 2015, where we uh, had 798, AB 798 by Susan Benia, the College Textbook Affordability Act of 2015. And that really created a framework around um, an incentive structure for campuses and faculty to accelerate the adoption of OER um, and allowed money to support professional development, the curation, technology supports, and, and, and a call for demonstrations of support from campuses as a basis to, to award these funds. Then we flipped to 2016, right? So coming closely on the heels, the first 5 million was allocated to the development of that inaugural zero textbook cost program. And I really have to tip my hat to Hal Plotkin, um, 
um, for having the vision to to bring it forth and and um, that was, you know, that obviously paved the way for additional funding. Uh, but in 2018, then the Academic Senate of the California Community Colleges requested and received six million to, to develop OER for the community colleges and launch the OER initiative. And, and hats off to Julie Bruno here and the whole um, Academic Senate leadership of the uh, California Community Colleges for really just putting a marker on this and saying, we see this as a priority, we see its benefits and we wanna lean into it. And, um, and so that was, I think, instrumental in, in where we are now. Um, but if you look at the past decade, right, minus you know, this last year, there's been this slow, steady interest and investment of funds uh, from Sacramento to support OER. Um, and to really try to help students with these increasing costs. And then, you know, that has ha that has paved the way for the latest really exciting news, which I know has already been discussed about um, the, the $115 million to dramatically expand the uh, ZTC program in the community college system. And um, it's kind of amazing how Governor Newsom, you know, he upped the ante, he upped the investment tenfold right? Um, and in a single year. And so when you look back on this, when people look back on this, you know, it'll be great to see that sort of steep upward curve um, of interest and support coming from Sacramento. But now in case some of you are thinking, what about the CSUs? What about the UCs? Um, I was, uh, I did talk to Governor Newsom's uh, very knowledgeable senior advisor on higher education. Her name is Londe Ajose. Um, Londe and Jose. And I asked Londe, you know, what message should I carry about this, right? I mean, the 150 million was super exciting, but what message should I carry about this? Uh, and her response was really, uh, was, was great. She said, you know, she said, listen, if our, if our, if the state's fiscal situation continues to be strong, um, that we should consider the $115 million to be a down payment on this administration and Governor Newsom, really, his commitment to eradicating the cost for all students and its textbook costs, its clicker costs, it's all the resources uh, that students need to buy to, to actually avail themselves of, of higher education. Um, but it was, it, so it, this, this idea of down payment, she said there's nothing precluding investments, further investment into UC and CSU. Um, community colleges, you know, they've been the first because they've been the first, honestly. Um, and as we sort of understood from the pandemic, the equity issues are really kind of the most pronounced there. Um, and so love to have, you know, uh, see the impact of, of ZTC uh, as soon as possible. But from the perspective of this, uh, this governor and this administration, they would really love to see a serious commitment from faculty and from all of the academic senates. Um, so I'm passing this on because it was a very, it was a very clear, unequivocal message, um, and and one uh, which we know because he he's stated it, but he's also backed it up with funding. Is that Gav Governor Gavin Newsom is really serious about this? He's really serious about eradicating the textbook costs and supporting the OER effort and the OER movement. Um, and so uh, Lante wasn't the only one I spoke to. From others, I, I heard sincere interest and support of OER. Um, they understand that there's excitement coming from the field, but there's also a landscape uh, question that I wanted to communicate about where is the, the right place to invest? What, what is going to yield the highest benefit for the state dollars invested? Uh, you know, how much OER do you need for a single class? Uh, do we need to focus on creation or should we focus on adoption? And uh, if we want to accept low cost, what, what, is that, what does low cost mean in this context? And then who do we even talk to to discuss these things? There's definitely better desire uh, or desire to better understand the landscape um, and have a better description uh, of the landscape and more cohesion in the message. Um, and then, of course, you know, I'll just add on, there, you know, data always is helpful as well, right, because um, I, I, I think that does matter. But just a better analysis of what we need, what we're aspiring to, and, and how we're going to get there uh, is, is what I heard. But what exactly is there? You know, what, is, what does it look like? Um, and, you know, what, what there is, I'll put that in quotes, 
probably depends on where you sit. Uh, if you sit in Sacramento, student academic success, student basic needs, you know, these are really paramount and what's driving support for OER in Sacramento. I mean, I, I think that's pretty clear. But I'm really curious, you know, based on, on this particular audience, what does there look like to you? Um, so I'd love to see some of your thoughts uh, typed in through the chat about what there looks like in five years time. What do you want it to look like? What do you think it should like in terms of where should the OER movement be? Um, and as you're typing this into the chat, hopefully, uh, I just wanted to say for the conference organizers, I think this is a great challenge to embrace. Um, if we were, you know, not just to think about faculty by faculty member or department by department or even campus by campus, uh, if we're thinking segment wide, if we're thinking statewide with all three segments, is there a cohesive plan to be had for the state? Um, can, can there actually be one? Uh, and, and I know they're supposed to, people are supposed to, I think, chat through, um, not Zoom, but uh, through Pathable. Uh, I did want to say one more note about Sacramento is that Sacramento loves to see all three segments working together. Um, because the idea of a cohesive public higher education system is, is really compelling to people at the state level. Uh, but the reality is it's just really hard for big systems to work together. So uh, we'll see whether, you know, that is something that can really come to, to fruition. But Delmar, I wanted to turn to you and to see if there's anything interesting coming to the chat uh, to share with the audience. There's well, certainly a lot of interesting things coming out here, and I'm going to give it in sort of a staccato uh, approach here. Uh, I'll start with uh, something that was right preceding your question, which was a desire for centralized OER resources uh, and uh, statistics on usage. Uh, more ZTC degrees, so I think uh, I would say it's augmenting or building more OER, um, uh, making that the default. Um, uh, being able to use OER in order to handle DEI, anti-racism, CRP related issues. Um, uh, a comment uh, 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 is in terms of making OER activity uh, a critical component of promotions, hiring, tenure uh, aspects on our respective campuses. Building of ancillary materials, um, homework, that's been uh, mentioned a few times. Uh, unified OER effort across all three systems uh, came up here. Um, and then lastly, actually there are a few more that I'm missing here, uh, but uh, gaining the respect of OER such that it has the same weight as its scholarly publishing uh, does in their uh, respective campus. Um, and making it a respectable and legitimate uh, option, which I think falls into that same category um, and such. And that, uh, that captures most of it. That I, I think I missed a few things there, but I think that's largely the gist that came out here. Okay, well, the, the chat will be captured um, and memorialized. So lots of great things in there. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And, and, and actually, you know, I'm gonna pick up on some of those threads that, that people have chatted. Um, and, and uh, to that question. But so part of the, so the rest of this talk is really about, uh, well, I shouldn't say the rest of part of this, the next part of this talk is what there looks like from my perspective, right? And so I've, uh, I've named this, this particular section a new frontier for, D, uh, for OER. And I think technology, DEI, and then what I'll call post-pandemic pedagogy, uh, PPP all factor in. Um, so let's start with technology. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, technology is obviously something that encompasses many, many things, but the examples that, that I want to talk about are Learning Lab funded projects that go deep into technology and or platform development. And the next, uh, I mean, the first one, um, Delmar, is based on your, your work uh, on LibreText. I, I think I told you I stole a few slides from you uh, from your recent presentation to the UC Board of Regents on this. So um, I do want to emphasize a few things about your project. Uh, next slide, please. So I don't need to talk about LibreText proper because this is something that all of you are probably a lot more uh, familiar with in a hands-on way than I am. 
Um, but the, the project that I wanted to mention um, that Learning Lab funded called Rebalancing the Equity Gap in Chemistry Education with Individualized Adaptive Learning, which is a mouthful. We call it ADAPT plus LibreTex. Um, this, is, this is the project that Delmar is actually uh, a PI on, or the PI on, I should say. But the project is building out the open homework system for general chemistry that'll be free um, on LibreTex. And so... Uh, this has the capacity uh, to not just impact the thousands of students um, directly through the grant and the faculty who are involved um, with the grant project, but it's about what happens afterwards, right? Because hundreds of thousands of students could potentially be impacted because there's so many students who take general chemistry. And can we save them all money if we can um, get faculty to adopt this homework system? So to me, that is that that looks like that, you know, that ridiculous upward curve um, that we'll see, you know, going from five to 115 million um, in the ZTC investment is you know, building on an existing um, OER platform, uh, which includes the construction, the dissemination, the learning. Through this, we're really taking an advantage of an opportunity to scale. Um, we're taking advantage of a built-in community and one that has a life cycle of refreshment built in. And so not only are we leveraging all of that value um, in the project, uh, they are Delmar is incorporating an adaptive learning component and a culturally responsive um, uh, component to this homework system. So now it's not just about huge savings to students represented in general, general chemistry, which is, you know, significant, but now it's also being about how can we be more learner centered while we are attending to the cost as well. And they don't have to just stop at chemistry either. So the potential to use this, this particular technology platform, and there are others though, are really significant to advancing the OER movement. Um, next slide, please. So I really love the term uh, Libreverse ecosystem, which is on this slide. Um, and this slide I, I, I loved, and again, this is Delmar's slide because um, it, it shows you all the different things that are that are involved, like the learning analytics, the community forums. You know, you can you can bring in Jupyter notebooks, but this idea of being massively interconnected. This is what OER can look like at scale powered by technology. Um, and so I think this is a really sort of powerful message and a powerful way in which you know, we can go um, dramatically upward in the curve. And then the next slide, um, uh, it actually shows you how, we can, how, how uh, things are advancing dramatically up a curve. And that is what you can get when you leverage a technology platform to advance adoption. Um, next slide. So this uh, next slide is a different project that Learning Lab funded coming out of UCLA and Cal State LA. Uh, and Pierce College is also involved. And it's called the Better Book Project. And it's an online interactive introductory statistics textbook. Uh, it's built on a technology platform that the PIs, Jim Stigler and G Sun, developed. Uh, and it's deliverable through multiple LMSs, Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, um, and, and potentially others. But the interesting thing about this project is that Jim and G didn't start out by saying we want to develop OER. Uh, they started out by saying we don't think our students are really learning in a way that sticks. Uh, they're learning the bits and the pieces and we're testing them on the bits and the pieces, but they don't know how to string the bits and pieces together. So they're not achieving that higher degree of learning where you can apply it to other concepts, other things. Um, next slide, please. So their, their starting point was creating something interactive that would help students learn conceptually, learn deeper, and then be able to make connections of their learning and, and apply it to new contexts. Uh, and they also decided to take an R&D approach to this so they could continually improve these materials, which they're able to do more readily because it's an online textbook. Um, and they also are able to incorporate the real-time feedback of student data to instructors, and again, um, it's the, their technology platform that allows them to do this. And they have this whole professional development community to support faculty in actually implementing this. Um, I do want to point out it's not an open system, which is a conscious decision they made because they actually wanted all of the learning to come back to them in the early years. But it's all free. 
to both students and faculty. And it wouldn't be possible without the technology platform that it powers both the approach and the use of all of these free materials. And then like OER, there's a real sense of contribution that, that faculty and students who are using this feel. Uh, next slide, please. So the last project I'll talk about is a mastery learning project coming out of UC Berkeley. Um, and this is Dan Garcia, who is a co-PI on this project. And the PI is Armando Fox, and they're both computer scientists. And here, Dan is talking about learning as it usually happens. Uh, and he's looking a little bit concerned because he's talking about the distribution of grades that happen because, uh, uh, because you know, classes are usually based on a fixed time model. And with a fixed time model, you end up with variable learning and variable grades. And he doesn't like students to get C's, D's, you know, or F's because he thinks they're capable of more. Uh, so go to the next slide. So here he's looking a little more excited because he's actually flipped the model of fixed time variable learning to fixed learning variable time based on this concept of mastery learning through the development of paradigm question generators, which was first developed at University of Illinois. Um, and uh, Dan and Armando talk about, you know, a paradigm based question generator is a piece of computer code that captures the essence of a, a, a or paradigm of an underlying specific problem type in a, a specific course. And so it can generate randomized question instances from it. Uh, and it gives students immediate feedback. It can generate more homework practice problems and different exam variants, right? With their, you know, so that it's, it's not, it doesn't, um, doesn't need so much faculty labor because uh, they're using um, the, com the computer basically to do it. But the result is it ends up giving students a lot more opportunities to learn, to master, to have second chances or, or additional chances to make up exams, which really reduces a lot of, uh, of stress. Uh, so next slide. Okay, so here's Dan looking actually happy now because now there's something that can, you know that can help uh, learners focus on learner success, where all students can attain mastery learning, and all of this is available as open educational resources. Um, so these are examples that are really relevant to STEM, but my colleagues tell me there are, are, are interesting things happening in other fields as well. And so we should look for opportunities for how technology and technology platforms can really help accelerate uh, the adoption of OER in those fields as well. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a lot at this conference already about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I did want to just share kind of our own uh, clues about how the heightened and hopefully sustained interest in incorporating DEI into the classroom and curriculum, uh, how that, you know, how that um, motivation can really advance the OER movement as well. And so last fall, we released a grant opportunity called Learning Lab Grand Challenge, Overcoming the Calculus Barrier to STEM Success. Uh, and we created this four-part webinar series um, called the Equity Conversation Series. And we, re we re required applicants to attend one of the, the webinars that we were hosting. Um, but we did decide to open it up to the broader community. And we don't have a very large mailing list, um, but we did send it to some who do. And we got almost a thousand unique participants across the four part series. I was strong participation from UC, CSU and community college uh, faculty across the board. Um, next slide. And so if people were interested in hearing um, uh, speakers like Estella Ben Simone, she's you know second from the left. She's one of the nation's leading scholars on racial equity. Uh, Lindsay Malcolm Pica is the Chief Institutional Research Officer and Head of DEI at Caltech. She's on the far left. And she, uh, she talked about understanding data as an actual equity practice. Um, and then we had our three academic Senate leaders on the right talk about faculty perspectives on race and gender equity as well. Um, next slide, please. The most popular one that we held was with Estella called the Syllabus as an Equity Practice. And this was very much about how to change classroom culture practice curriculum to be reflective of and framed by DEI. And this to us indicated a real hunger from faculty to understand sort of the practical aspects of how and, uh, uh, and a real openness to applying 
DEI, DEI frame. Um, and what was what was really impressive, honestly, is that that all these faculty, they wanted to do it in the middle of pandemic exhaustion, and they wanted to do it in the middle of Zoom exhaustion, which I think everybody was and, and probably still is. Um, so next slide, please. This brings me to the topic of post pandemic pedagogy. And we're not really post pandemic yet, uh, but this is about how despite the fact that, that most of pandemic living was uh, and is you know, uh, incredibly hard, there have been some good things or pieces of knowledge that have come out of it. And how do we take those things that we did or learned during the pandemic that worked um, and how do, so how do we build on those things and how do we build on the things that make sense? Uh, next slide, please. So um, uh, we have um, uh, we we have a project uh, called called humanizing, um, and one of the things that the pandemic and remote instruction I think really taught us was how vital the human element is, and we've not paid a lot of attention to doing it in an online environment. Everybody was so caught up trying to figure out Zoom and breakout rooms and recording their lectures online. Um, and it was a very heroic endeavor, um, but we didn't have a leg up prior to the pandemic on really how to humanize the classroom in an online mode, which would have come in really handy. Um, but it turns out that during our first round of grants, um, Learning Lab funded a, a project on humanizing online teaching. Michelle, Michelle uh, Pekansky Brock is the PI, and she's from Foothill De Anza, um, and also affiliated with CBC OEI. And Kim Vincent Layton is from Humboldt, and she is the co-PI. And they've put this um, really amazing professional development course on humanizing online instruction. And so here you can see that humanizing leverages the science of human learning and culturally responsive teaching to create inclusive, equitable online uh, class climates for today's students who are very diverse. Uh, it acknowledges that the students are capable, resilient human beings um, who have who they bring an array of perspectives and knowledge to the classroom. Um, positive instructor student relationships are prioritized and they serve as the connective tissue between students, engagement, and importantly, rigor. Um, next slide, please. So you can see here that humanizing is based on principles of, of trust, presence, awareness, and somehow empathy has gotten cut off, but empathy is in there. Um, and then how, uh, and then there's an actual pedagogy to humanizing. Um, but how is this related to OER really, right? Um, the humanizing work, and it's everything from creating a liquid syllabus where you create this warm, welcoming, accessible message to something called warm demander pedagogy. It's based on authentic interactions um, online between the faculty member, the students, and the other students. Um, so it's about bringing everybody kind of bringing the, you know, themselves into the classroom. And unlike what some would say when you bring a publisher's textbook into the classroom that you're bringing the publisher's view of the world in, this is, this is about bringing your own view of the world, your authentic self into the classroom. And OER can really facilitate that where you're adapting and curating materials from your authentic self um, that's relevant to the authentic selves of your students. Next slide, please. So what does, uh, what does post-pandemic pedagogy look like, right? And so um, I put on the slide what I think it looks like. I think it looks humanized and caring. Um, I think it's highly inclusive and DEI framed. Um, I think it gives students lots of chances to succeed. And I think it's built on technology platforms that invite community and ease the burden for faculty. And, and here's the kicker, right? It's all powered by an OER mindset and actual OER. That's my version of what uh, post-pandemic pedagogy looks like um, with OER. So next slide, please. So now it's your turn to chat what you think post-pandemic post pedagogy looks like. Because I'm not faculty. Um, I'm really curious to know to know what you think. And so, uh, Delmar, I'll turn to you to to do the same as you did last time, which is maybe um, hit some highlights of of what people think uh, 
that looks like and how OER can factor very importantly um, into that. And I'll take a sip of water while, uh, while you're reading. No problem. No one has come in yet. Um, I was just in the middle of tweeting uh, the, the exact question for, and, and picked up here. Okay. Um, we have a, a request to add universal design uh, for learning into the inclusive element. Um, introduce flexibility in course and assessment design. Uh, mindful of universal design uh, that uh, not returning to normal, uh, using this as an opportunity in order to uh, get out of the rut that we were in before. Uh, remote uh, online flexibility, um, engaging of students in co-creating curricula, uh, introduce a greater compassion for students, uh, uh, greater compassion for our colleagues, uh, 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 more authentic assessments, uh, uh, maybe a little bit of reservations in terms of uh, technology being the solution for everything, um, and there may be uh, non-technology solutions that are better suited, uh, pretty suited by non-technology, of course, more adaptive learning for each student. <clears throat> um, another sound out for authentic assessments, uh, making uh, learning truly an active experience. Almost that's all, great. Of, yeah, that's, that's great. what I have right now. Okay, that's that's a lot. Um, can we go to the next slide? And I'm I'm wondering if this yeah this is where my acad you see academic slides when I was a, <laughs> um, I, I I did want to just say you know the UC Academic Senate um, did a survey recently and you can see that it's called Faculty and Instructor Remote Instruction Survey. I just put in a couple of slides here um, and this is like a vote for empathy. Um, honestly, there. Uh, uh, you know, through that survey, they asked a lot of different questions like, you know, of faculty and instructors, like, what were your technology needs? Were they met? Did you feel like your research suffered? How did you feel like your students fared, et cetera? But there was one on flexibility and accommodations, which I did want to point out. Um, and the question was, compared to in-person classes, how would you rate your flexibility and willingness to provide accommodations regarding class-related expectations in the undergraduate courses you taught during the pandemic? And all the blue and dark blue indicate uh, that, that that willingness was, was somewhat higher and much higher, um, with the exception of UCSF was the outlier because they actually don't really um, serve undergraduates per se. So the, this question was kind of odd that they, they were included. But that's an almost an overwhelming number of respondents uh, who indicated that willingness to be flexible. And to me, that goes back to whoever you know talked about uh, empathy is how can we hold on to that honestly um, and, and, and make it sort of a, a permanent feature of the landscape because I think it really will make a, a difference. Um, and honestly, you know, the, the, the textbook costs also, that is a feature of empathy as well, I think, is to understand, you know, where the students are. Uh, so let's skip over the next slide and go to the slide after, which is how to get there. Um, so regardless of you know whether you're there, looks like my there, looks like somebody else is there, um, the answer to how we get there, I put in the subtitle, uh, gradually and then suddenly. And does anybody know the reference? If you do type it in the chat, I'm just curious to know how many people uh, know that reference. But I think um, how to get there includes four things. And if we could go to the next slide, I think the four things, um, and it's a minimum, honestly, there's so many other things, it includes narrative, data, goals, and friction reduction about how we get there. Um, and I'll talk uh, about narrative and friction reduction. I'll leave data and goals to somebody else to figure out uh, who's a little bit closer to, to the work, um, but narrative. So next slide, please. You have a Hemingway, by the way. Yep, that, okay, that's it, Hemingway, ding, ding, ding. Um, how many people, do you recognize on this slide, right? I'm on the upper right corner. Uh, you all know the man in the middle. Uh, lower right is Delmar, which you, you should recognize Delmar by now. Hal, you saw yesterday on the lower left. On the upper left is Paul Stacy, who is the head of Open Education Global, which is really about open everything, open access, open data, open science, open educational resources. So I put all of these pictures under this narrative umbrella 
I happen to be talking to three of the four folks in this in the past couple couple of weeks, and I didn't talk to Governor Gavin Newsom, so he he's out of it. Uh, but I thought a lot about sort of what I heard relative to conversations that could feed into a narrative. Um, so go to the next slide, please. So let's end this racket. Um, that very much, I think, is the clear message that Governor Newsom is sending. It's it, it is simple. It is concise. Um, and it is compelling in terms of, you know, this is the one thing to do and we're going to do it. Um, and so I think it's, it's a very forceful message. The textbook of the future, and it got split up with the textbook of the people. But this is something Delmar said to the UC Board of Regents last week or two weeks ago when, you know, we were asking, like, where is, what is OER? Where is this going? Um, and, and Delmar responded with this, this two-part phrase, and it's, incredibly high minded, but it's like something that you know you want to like charge forth on both of these points about the textbook of the future and the textbook of the people. Um, and so I think that's a really compelling narrative for OER. A digital master plan for higher education. Hal talked about that yesterday. Uh, master plan for higher education is a little inside baseball, but um, honestly, the, it's it's very familiar to a lot of us, and it is high time, right, to sort of think about what a digital master plan looks like. So I think that that, that that's got a high degree of success too. Um, from Paul Stacy, I really thought about uh, his message that there are so many opens, um, the open science, open data, open access. And when you when you bring them all together, you have you can have real transform transformation. So uh, for him, I, I kind of thought about open education will be transformative. And then I put in sort of my playful contribution is OER, the new jazz, which I'll explain a little bit later. Uh, but you might have a favorite narrative or you might have your own narrative or slogan that you think, you know, this is what's going to advance OER. And if you have one, type it into the chat so that the conference organizers can see this. But uh, for me, um, focusing on this narrative part is really important because I don't ever think that data by itself carries the day. Um, and even if you have goals, you need this driving force to make the goals stick. Uh, and friction reduction is hard. Uh, so you kind of need, you know, something like a, a reason to keep doing that. And for me, narrative always kind of is something you can come back to and it ties the ties everything together um, and sort of it, 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 it makes you persist um, in uh, what you want to do. Uh, so the next slide, and we are almost towards the end here. Um, is a word cloud. Uh, and it is really based on my friction reduction conversation with Paul Stacy, who has been working on this area for a long time. But the, my major takeaways from that conversation are in this word cloud. We need rewards for faculty. Um, and this was mentioned earlier on through the chat from, uh, from one of you, right? Which is, we have an established culture when it comes to research, and it's obvious that you build on the work of others, but there's just not a similar way in which we reward that same thing, building on the work of others in teaching and learning materials. And so can we overcome this disconnect um, and have it be rewarded? And what rewarded means, I don't know. It, you know, it could be money, it could be time, it could be acknowledgement, promotion, um, any and all of those things, right? Uh, maybe should be on the table. Um, so the question Paul really challenged was, uh, or, or posed, and, and it's a challenge, is when and how are we going to create, both structurally and culturally, a reward system, right, for um, uh, the process by which, you know, we develop and evaluate teaching and learning materials? Um, when can we do that? Um, other things in this word cloud, word cloud are work in teams, right? Librarians are, are playing a great role in searching and, and finding OER on behalf of faculty. Um, this idea of, of, of having faculty develop things collective, like collectively, working together um, could be a force uh, it, or reduce, some, reduce friction. Um, building a graduated path to follow, right? Uh, you know, first there's aware, an, an awareness, followed by maybe a willingness or, or curiosity, then trying it yourself, and then modifying, enhancing, and then sharing your own. There really is a pathway, but maybe our expectations are, are skewed that we expect everybody to go from one to five. Um, so, can, you know, is there more of a graduated pathway that we can build? 
uh, then there's a be a DJ in there. And so, we, you know, there's this, this is based on a conversation about are faculty composers of music, players of music, or, or DJs, as you know, the analogy goes. And so is the narrative of OER uh, a classical music model where you're playing, you know, the works of other composers? Or should it be more like one of jazz, you know, with riffs and inspiration and variation and, and the ability to make something your own? Um, and, and, you know, I, Paul, and I've heard others say this, is like maybe the DJification uh, aspect of it is, is what we should play up. Uh, one last thought about friction reduction, uh, about making things easier for faculty, is really how OER can and should be incorporated in a variety of professional development opportunities, which are scarce from the get-go. Um, but uh, just another couple of Learning Lab pro uh, funded projects, a STEM reading apprenticeship program at uh, the CSU Chancellor's Office, Emily Magruder uh, and then Nika Hogan from the um, CS, uh, the Success Center at the community colleges. Uh, they've really highlighted that one of the challenges facing STEM instructors is curating high quality materials from what might seem like an overwhelming array of resources. So they're really trying to help do the work and explicitly choosing to, um, uh, uh, to identify zero cost texts that can support deep disciplinary learning. Okay, so um, one last slide, right? Because you know we're coming to the end of this long uh, meandering discussion called the keynote. And the last slide I wanna share really brings it back to students. Um, I hope you can read this comment, at, but from a student who took the class uh, that Armando Fox and Dan Garcia were implementing as part of the paradigm-based question generators. I found it to be the best remote exam experience I've had this semester in terms of reducing test taking uh, related stress and anxiety as much as possible, allowing me to really focus on the material and learn it to the best of my ability. I mean, who wouldn't want love to see that as an impact, right, from, uh, from a change that they made uh, within their class. So OER clearly gives us the opportunity to reduce the cost burdens to students in a dramatic way, which is equity. Uh, but it's also a license to take the classroom into the future where the humanized interactions uh, enrich the learning experience, where inclusivity um, and relevance, whether it's career or culture, can be layered on and, and enrich the learning experience, um, where technology platforms can be used to really scale up that benefit for lots and lots of students. Um, so, you know, I wanted to share a, a quote that I had heard last week, um, and I had heard it before, and I had forgotten about it. And, and it is, you know, it is that Hemingway quote that the speaker was talking about how does change happen, both good and bad, right? Um, but in describing how change happens, it's, it's, you know, the answer is gradually and then suddenly, <laughs> um, gradually and then suddenly. And you know, as I was, I talked to Hal Plotkin last week and, and I caught some of his keynote yesterday and he said a lot of funny things. And he said this yesterday. Um, and, you know, Hal's really been this true pioneer of OER and he's worked so hard uh, to make this promise, you know, be real and large and impactful, but he's been working on this for a long time. So um, when I asked him, you know, Hal, so, so where are we? You know, especially in light of the 115 million for, for California Community Colleges. And he said this yesterday, his response was, finally, we are at the beginning, right? Which, you know, when I, uh, when I heard this last week, it made me laugh. And, but it also made me think about um, the Hemingway quote, gradually and then suddenly. So I'm going to take Hal's response, finally, we are at the beginning, to mean finally, we are at the beginning of suddenly. And so I really hope that that's what happens from here on out. Um, Delmar, that is it for my comments. I'm turning it back to you. Thank you very much, Larka. We appreciate uh, everything that you mentioned here. Um, I don't know if we were supposed to clap uh, virtually, uh, but I'm going to do that as soon as I figure out how to do so. Um, or I'll just do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, are there questions uh, that uh, people may have? Uh, please put them in the chat and I can run with that. Uh, there were a few uh, discussions that came on in regards to the sun also shines and even references to the uh, discussion where that quote came from in the book. Um, so we have people who really uh, know Hemingway here. Yes, it was um, about bankruptcy, I believe, but. There you go. <laughs> 
um, and a reference to Lenin um, that had something similar. So how about I start with a question here uh, in, in terms of, you know, starting. Uh, what are the odds of other states uh, being influenced by what's going on in California and certainly by the the investment that the governor's office, I'm afraid the, the legislature has actually invested in an OER. Can that actually be a grassroots effort for state to state instead of being a federal uh, effort to push upon the states? And that's not necessarily a bad term, but it's just a different perspective. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think so. I think that there are states that have, and, and, and um, public education systems, higher education systems that have been very active in this. And I think this is a motivating factor uh, for, uh, for various states, right? To say, okay, you know, this, this is real. But, at, you know, as you know, it also depends on what is a state's fiscal situation, right? Ours happened to be really good this year. And this, um, and, and Governor Newsom took advantage of it uh, to say, hey, we're doing this. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, sometimes there's like little friendly competitions with other states as well. So I really do hope that, that this spurs other governors um, and uh, other public higher education systems to say, yeah, this is not pie in the sky anymore. This is real. Um, and then as Londe said, you know, we hope this is a down payment honestly, that this isn't, this isn't the full thing uh, where Sacramento says, we gave you a lot of money now, you know, uh, let's see what you do and then not give us any more. But uh, we have to show, we have to show that we're committed um, and we have to show what we want to do with that money. Sounds great. Um, there were some questions regarding centralizing efforts uh, that involves centralizing OER efforts across uh, all three systems and also uh, centralizing uh, OER content into uh, one or few number of repositories. Um, did you have uh, an idea about the viability of a more centralized uh, push rather than three independent uh, pseudo independently operating um, programs? Yeah, I, I, I think um, that that would be a great thing to do. And I think that uh, policymakers and the budget folks in Sacramento would see that um, as a huge, as a huge benefit. Uh, you know, CSU has got a pretty robust system in Merlot. Um, but I would also say that um, CVC OEI is also a great repository as well. Um, that really, you know, people people tend to uh, work in in more in fiefdoms. Um, intersegmental work is really hard, uh, as a lot of our grantees know. It's it's a wonder. It's it's great in the sense that you get to learn a lot and you get to. Um, you get to really try to uh, leverage benefits for students, you know, across the entire um, three segments. But it is really, it is really hard work. But um, it is doable. Um, this, this is not the same. This is, this is easier than climate change. How's that? You know, we can, we can do this. Um, we, we need to have um, the will. We need to have a reason. We need to have some funding to do these things. That's great. There's a, a question that was really early on in the. Um... Uh, in the presentation, and it, it touches upon something uh, that I think pervades the, the, the whole uh, meeting, and that is uh, the whole K-12 space. Um, so there's a, a, there's a great opportunity for OER to contribute not just to post-secondary education, but to primary and secondary education. What are the complexities involved in being able to actually pursue that uh, sort of goal in that realm? That, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I don't know in a, I don't know as much about the the K twelve system, um, which is all more tightly controlled, honestly, than than higher education is. Right, public higher education um, is is a much different kind of landscape. Whereas, you know, in um, in K twelve, you have the board of education. Um, that's that's the state board of education at play. You have school districts at play. 
Um, so I, you know, I, I, and I don't know if, if the questioner is talking about high schools, et cetera, but there are, you know, there's one project that I could already tell you um, is actually making strides in, in high schools, right? Because it, it bridges the, the nexus to, um, to higher education. And this is the Corsicata Better Book Project. So they are hungry. I, there is a hunger out there, honestly, for great, um, you know, great materials, if they're adaptive, if they're, you know, if we're, we're layering all those things on it, right? In terms of the, uh, the adaptivity, um, the inclusivity, uh, the technology platform, there's already interest there. And so um, it's a matter of what is, what, is, um, what is the value add of the things that we can develop that then K-12, especially at the high school level, can take advantage of. I think uh, there's already evidence that, that you know, they are hungry for things because they want to see their students transition to post-secondary well as well. So anything that can sort of give them um, a good leg up, I think, um, has a lot of appeal. Right. That would probably involve some sort of discussion with the, the uh, state board uh, regarding these sort of aspects. And um, I'm not sure what the complications are in being able to get that on the landscape or if it's been on the landscape and it hasn't uh, crossed my desk. Anyways, uh, it is now a few minutes uh, after two. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Lark again for a very engaging presentation. Uh, I enjoyed it quite greatly and I'm sure many people uh, also got a lot of information from that. So thank you again, Lark, and I appreciate this. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. So...